Hello, I'm Brenda Mitchell. When I was elected president of United Teachers of New Orleans in 1999, our union already had a 62-year history of working for teachers, paraeducators, and clericals of the New Orleans Public Schools. This video, produced just before my election, provides a review of the highlights that have made UTNO a strong organization. I hope you share my pride in what we have accomplished through our solidarity. But more importantly, I want to remind you that the history of our union that will be recounted in the future depends on the work that we do today and every day. Joining Hands, a lesson in solidarity, the history of United Teachers of New Orleans. Today, more than 90% of the teachers, paraprofessionals, and clerical employees who work in the New Orleans public schools are members of the United Teachers of New Orleans. UTNO provides its members a voice in the workplace and negotiates salaries, benefits, and protections through the collective bargaining process. New Orleans may be known as the Big Easy, but organizing school employees and working to improve the schools of this city has always been a struggle. Our story begins in the 1930s, when a typical class size was a classroom of 60 students. Paychecks were irregular because of the economic hardship caused by the Great Depression, and New Orleans, like the rest of the South, was divided by a system of segregation. In 1937, a group of African-American women school teachers formed American Federation of Teachers Local 527 in an effort to obtain equal pay for equal work. The new AFT local hired a young lawyer who would go on to become a Supreme Court Justice, Thurgood Marshall, to lead the fight for salary equalization between black and white teachers. When I started, I started with $100 a month. I was a normal graduate certified by the state. A white teacher, normal graduate, certified by the state, made $120. And by the time we filed the equalization suit, by that time I had acquired a BA degree. The white teacher with a BA degree in the same number of years of experience that I had was making $700 more than I was making. Building a union in the Deep South wasn't easy. Union organizers received many death threats, and at least one firebomb was thrown at a gathering of local 527 supporters. However, in the 1960s, the movement to organize New Orleans teachers began to pick up speed. New Orleans teachers, inspired by the civil rights movement and the teacher union movement in northern cities, began to clamor for fair play, better wages, and improved working conditions. They have a joint responsibility beyond their collective bargaining relationship. The union uh, at that time was, uh, it was a name, but I think the uh, indignities that were heaped upon the teachers caused the union to gain uh, a little more force because then we began to talk uh, the idea that in union uh, there is strength and in strength there is power. And this was the concept that we sold to the teachers. See, you can't defend yourself against a, a system by yourself, but if you have an organization, you're in a better position to do that. As a result of this displeasure of teachers, we petitioned the board to allow us to decide on whether or not we wanted collective bargaining. These petitions were presented to the Board of Education and as my memory serves me, they never responded to those conditions, that they just took the petitions and put them in the garbage can. Well, that certainly angered us. The school district's refusal to grant collective bargaining caused teachers to take to the streets. This stretch of Canal Street was the scene of AFT Local 527's first major demonstration. In April of 1966, the union called for a walkout against the school district. The strike, the first teacher strike below the Mason-Dixon line, collapsed after only three days. The 66 strike was followed by another strike in 1969. In 69, once again, and the strike was about having the right to determine whether or not we wanted collective bargaining or not. Not who would be the agent, but whether or not we could 
we could have. We wanted collective bargaining. We stayed out 11 days on that occasion. And I can remember the superintendent getting on, on the tube and saying that if you don't report to work on tomorrow, then you're going to be fired. I'm happy to say that I was one of those who remained one more day in protest against the superintendent's demand. And uh, as my memory serves me, nobody was, was fired. It was just a threat that uh, the superintendent gave us. But I was talking to my father, and he asked me, he said, well, how did you all make out? I said, well, we lost a strike. <laughs> He said, well, you don't lose a strike. You all didn't work hard enough. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that really motivated me to go down and assist the union. And, and uh, I've been coming to the union office every day. I never miss a day <laughs> since uh, my dad told me that. That was in 1969, and I've been doing what I could to assist the union since 1969. The union's leaders realized more than strikes would be required to achieve collective bargaining. Between 1969 and 1974, uh, the AFT, local in New Orleans, very aggressively pursued bargaining by going into the buildings and talking to teachers. But we also had a major public campaign. We put up billboards all around the city. We had a speaker's bureau to go out and speak to various groups. Uh, we met with the local politicians from the mayor, the city council, uh, school board members. We met with the business community, the chamber. Uh, we took our plight to the uh, labor movement. We met with the New Orleans central body. And we met with several uh, of, of the more important or uh, larger unions in New Orleans. It wasn't just a public relations and political campaign that marked the union's change in strategy. In 1971, Local 527 began merger discussions with New Orleans' other teacher organization, the Orleans Education Association, an NEA affiliate. We um, met with the AFT, and the first meeting we had was a uh, disaster. Uh, all the enmity that uh, had developed over the years uh, erupted at the meeting table and uh, the best that we could do at that meeting was decide to meet again. Uh, we met again and uh, began to develop some relationships that uh, could bring us forward and, and we began to make agreements and uh, pretty soon uh, we had an organization put together. We got together and we said hey we're not going to win this unless we join hands together. And uh, in 1972, uh, the agreement was struck as a result of uh, NEA and AFT coming together and uh, joining hands and calling ourselves the United Teachers of New Orleans. We had uh, circulated petitions in all the schools and asked teachers to sign the petitions uh, in favor of collective bargaining. The response was, was overwhelming. and. Uh, Fred Skelton, who worked for United Teachers New Orleans at the time, uh, had this idea that we ought to get our picture taken for the newspaper. We gathered 20,000 signatures. I, I can remember it standing out on the corner, and when we talked about collective bargaining, they were ready to sign. Uh, people going to, to shopping centers that weekend, people going to their churches, and we thought if we could get you know, four or 5,000 signatures, we'd really be doing well. We got boxes of, of, of petitions. In fact, we had a, 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 almost a parade of people when we went to the collective bargaining school board vote. I can remember we had four or five people bringing in these cardboard boxes full of petitions signed by community members. Had a tremendous impact. In 1974, by a three to two vote, the New Orleans School Board approved collective bargaining for teachers. Amazingly, teachers now have the right to collectively bargain in a state that doesn't have a law allowing collective bargaining. The next job for Utno was to sit down at the table and negotiate a contract. Bob Bates uh, was assigned by the AFT to be our chief negotiator and did an excellent job. Collective bargaining agreements uh, cover wages, hours, and terms and conditions of employment and whatever people thought were proper to put on the table as a term and condition had to be defined and we negotiated over well, probably three or four hundred issues and uh, 
primarily being wages and benefits and uh, what happens in the classroom, what happens in the schools, what, hap what happens in the streets and the buses and, and uh, parking lots and every the whole ball of wax. Uh, and so they, they really approached it from a kind of an all-inclusive uh, perception of what goes on in the workplace. And, and it took many months to, to deal with all of that. Like most voice contracts, there's a lot in there that uh, you can be proud of. I mean, we were able to regulate the use of the school bells uh, in most schools, and I'm sure this is true across the country, the classes are quite often interrupted by the intercom system and bells, and we were able to regulate that. We were able to take teachers off of duty or restricted to 10 minutes before school and, and to 10 minutes after, and then only for one-fourth of the teachers. Uh, we took teachers off of lunch duty, and we were able to just make improvements in a variety of areas, such as giving teachers the right to serve on textbook selection committees. We also created building committees. Uh, the building committee is made up of several teachers elected by the staff, and that committee has a right to discuss with the principal on a monthly basis school operations. And so we began to give teachers a voice in decision making all the way down to the building level. And that's, that's been a big plus for the union. During the 70s, Utno's membership rapidly grew. In addition to teachers, Utno also began to represent and organize paraprofessional and clerical employees. Paraprofessionals saw a need because we weren't organized, we didn't receive any kind of benefits, and Utno was a growing organization, and we felt like we would get benefits if we were a part of the organization. We, as clericals, sat with the negotiating team uh, of Utno and created a contract, which in fact we negotiated with the board, which we were very happy with. Later, the union started a chapter for retired members. We started our organization on volunteerism. We wanted an organization to do something to help our union. Utno prides itself on being a full-service union. Among the services the union provides are a number of professional development activities for teachers as well as paraprofessional and clerical employees. In the 70s, Otno developed a highly respected annual professional issues conference called Quest. The Quest conference itself grew from maybe around 200 teachers to approximately um, 1,500 to 2,000 teachers. Uh, it was a, an event that everybody uh, looked forward to. The spring of the year, we knew that two things were going to occur in, in, in New Orleans. We were going to have Jazz Fest, and the United Teachers of New Orleans was going to have its Quest Conference. Beyond Quest, the union hosted workshops for parents of kindergartners, sponsors a college scholarship program for students who major in education, and operates a teacher center to train and assist teachers and paraprofessionals. Today, the Utno Center for Professional Growth and Development is housed in a state-of-the-art facility and is funded through the Union's Health and Welfare Fund. Utno, for over 20 years, has been involved in professional development, working with students, with parents, and with its members as well. The consumers, the students, are important to us. And so we try to provide opportunities for teachers to be the best that they possibly can be, whether it's through information that we disseminate, workshops that we offer through the union or through the center, whether it's providing an opportunity for students to become teachers as well by getting one of our scholarships, whether it's sending a member on a, 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 a trip to attend a conference to bring information back, or just being a viable force at school board meetings, speaking to those issues, or in the community at large. The Health and Welfare Fund was a benefit negotiated during the union's second contract negotiation. Prior to the 70s, New Orleans school workers didn't even have hospitalization, let alone a full range of health benefits. In our second round of negotiations, we were able to negotiate uh, the union's health and welfare fund. Uh, which is a fund that we really began with just ten dollars per member contribution from the board and that that is now up to roughly eight hundred and fifty dollars per year per member and with that we offer a number of benefits in addition to the board uh, uh, sponsored hospitalization program so that our teachers now have a dental plan a vision plan 
and several insurance programs, uh, free prescriptive drugs. Uh, so it's been a real good program for us. It was through lobbying that uh, I know established the health and welfare fund. The school system through bargaining said we couldn't, they couldn't recognize it unless we had a law. We got a law. The 1970s were a very prosperous time for New Orleans and the state of Louisiana. Following the Arab oil embargo, oil revenues dramatically increased. The state and city were able to finance projects such as the Superdome. Despite the economic boom, in 1978, negotiations for a raise failed. UTNO members once again went on strike. This was the first successful strike in the Deep South. I think there had been a growing frustration. The first couple of contracts that we had, we didn't get very much money. Uh, we felt that uh, we had to show the school system that collective bargaining was a serious enterprise. Uh, there just was an emotional feeling that, that they were insulting us uh, at the bargaining table. It, it uh, strikes are as much emotional. They're, they're as much about dignity as they are about money. The school board's reluctance, uh, refusal to provide a pay increase was unreasonable, and we were able, again, to take that to the public. Uh, our school district is not one that is well financed, so I can never tell you that uh, the board had an awful lot of dollars. Uh, but it, it did find dollars to provide uh, the 7 percent increase. Uh, again, if you don't press, uh, the board is not likely to give in to just simply a demand that's on the bargaining table. And so we learned that early on, and we've been able to uh, negotiate most of our contracts uh, without strikes. We've had two strikes, 1978 and 1990, since we have been involved in bargaining, and we've been successful. The union's leaders knew that success at the bargaining table was dependent on success at the ballot box and in the halls of the legislature. Utno started a long process of working to improve the clout of the Louisiana Federation of Teachers, while simultaneously building a powerful New Orleans-based political action and legislative program. On election day, we mobilize our troops, and what we have is what we call sometimes a flying squad. And that is that we'll take a 55-passenger bus, a 47-passenger bus, and we'll put members on the bus, and we'll go in that candidate's area on election day from area to area and what we basically do is our coordinator will say okay uh, this is where we need to send people and we'll send the 47 people out canvas that area with certain t-shirts on that says i know flying squad on election day uh, we normally have upwards of 150 people out working in the streets encouraging people to go out and vote I don't think there's anybody who runs for public office that does not at least seek our support. Uh, we played a major role in efforts in Louisiana to defeat David Duke. Uh, we worked with other organizations, the New Orleans AFL-CIO, the A. Philip Randolph Institute, and the Coalition of Black uh, Trade Unionists. And in those efforts, we've been able to mobilize our voters to get them out in large numbers. And as a result of that, uh, New Orleans has voted overwhelmingly for Edwards in the Duke election. Uh, I think that Evan Edwards came out of New Orleans with a 100,000 vote lead. We were very active in the efforts to elect Senator Mary Landrieu, where she led her opponent by 100,000 votes in New Orleans. And it was that kind of lead that allowed her to go on and to eke out a narrow victory. But we're involved in all elections. Uh, by working actively with candidates. We basically will assign uh, one of our members to be a coordinator, and then that particular member will recruit other members to actually go to those campaign headquarters to help with the mailings, to do street canvassing, and to man the phones. In 1990, the school district refused to provide a raise for district employees. Although teachers had received raises that same year through state action, Paraprofessionals had not received a raise for years. In solidarity with the paraprofessionals, all UTNO members walked the picket line. In 1990, we were involved in negotiations, and we had gotten to the point where we asked the board 
if they would give our parents and clericals a raise because the state hadn't given them a raise in like seven years. And we felt that we knew that uh, teachers basically had been given raises by the state. So they weren't going to be as anxious to get a raise as were the parents and clericals because the governors had not given paraprofessionals anything. And we thought we were very close to settling. We were like $345,000 apart. And uh, they just said no. So we called a mass rally and we had about 3,500 teachers and paraprofessionals and clericals to come to that rally. And they took a vote that uh, by September the 17th, if we had not settled, that we were going to go out, out on strike. And uh, on September the 17th, we didn't settle, so we went out on strike. The union is involved in a wide range of community and professional activities. The Art on the Bus program is one example of how UTNO raises the profile of New Orleans schools and students in the larger community. Soon, the union and its credit union will move from its current location to a new facility adjacent to the UTNO Health and Welfare Fund building. The union continues to build, to grow, to plan for the 21st century, but the challenges facing UTNO members and the New Orleans public schools continue to be great. But the work of the union goes on, that our city, like other cities, is failing to adequately prepare students for the 21st century. While we've done a good job with some students, we have to expand the number of students that we're reaching. And then to do that, it is going to take a close working relationship between all of our communities, the religious, the business, labor, the school community, and the political community. And I would encourage the leaders in those communities to sit down and to think about the fact that if we're going to make New Orleans a place where people will want to live and raise children, then we're going to have to improve the quality of life. And the first step in that direction is improving the schools. And I would want every teacher to adopt the attitude that the school at which I work, I want that school to be a place where I would be proud and willing to send my son or daughter. And if we can get people to think in that vein, then I think that we can begin to seriously confront the problems that confront in public education. 